Welcome, everyone, to the Davos Fingers Reread Project podcast. Here's how it works. We'll, uh, we'll read approximately six chapters every couple weeks. We're then going to analyze the shit out of them. Uh, the idea is you guys can read along at our pace, follow along, get the most out of your own reread, or if you're on your first time read, you can do that too. Uh, we have with us tonight the Davos Fingers team. We have Matt, trainer extraordinaire, Star Wars geek, Lover of Tolkien and music. <laughs> Say hi, Matt. Greetings. We also have Brooke, the veteran reader of A Song of Ice and Fire. She found the books long, long before the show. She's very proud of that fact. She reminds Thank you us of for, it. Making, yeah. for making <laughs> note of that. She's on her fourth reread, I think, right? But who's yeah. counting? <laughs> uh, guilty pleasure, she admitted it was Harry Potter, but she always comes back to A Song of Ice and Fire. Heck yeah. And myself, I'm Scott, a uh, veteran of two reads through A Song of Ice and Fire, a lover of most nerdy things, including Battlestar Galactica, Star Wars, Tolkien, and more. And uh, we'll be taking you through this magical journey of A Song of Ice and Fire. Yep. We should mention that it is Brooke that started all of this for all of us, if mm. I'm not mistaken. So all credit due to the Brookness. So thank uh-huh. you. Indeed. Heavy thanks. Thanks, guys. Yeah, every time I smack a piece of Game of Thrones HBO series paraphernalia out of someone's hand, (laughs) I scream, I started all this. (laughs) Well, I I will, I I will, uh, I will give a quick shout out to the show. That uh, the first thing I ever saw was the show. I didn't even know there were books, and I saw the last half hour of of the first episode of the show just by chance. And then later, talking to Brooke, she's like, "You know, those are books, right?" (laughs) And and then my obsession was found. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember we were talking about uh, books on a work conference call once, and Brooke mentioned that she was reading those books, and it intrigued me. And I was like, I'm going to go pick those up. And Brooke, knowing of my uh, religious heritage, warned me against them, <laughs> and I didn't listen <laughs> to my to my everlasting credit. Pat myself on the back. I didn't listen to Brooke's warnings, and I did read them, and uh, it hooked me. So. Very you, good know, you are an outstandingly open-minded dude, my friend. <laughs> also, I, like, I have to like turn this around while we're all giving like mutual pats and say you guys have completely exceeded me in like arcane random knowledge about the books now. Uh, so just to clarify something as we're going through this whole reread project, it is going to be completely spoiler free. As Scott mentioned, all of us have read the books more than one time, all five of them, but we won't be delving into any topics that we shouldn't. For those of you first time readers, we are going to stay on course with the books. We are going to do a cool little feature at the end of every show for just a few minutes that we're going to call Devils After Dark. Insert cool uh, jingle music. And uh, we're going to just have a no holds barred free for all talking spoilers, talking theories, whatever we want to talk about. For, so for you, those of you longtime veteran readers, you might enjoy sticking around for that. For those of you who've never read the books, we're going to give you fair warning when Davos After Dark starts. So turn it off as soon as you can, unless you want to hear all the crazy stuff that we're going to bring up and talk about. So this week we're discussing uh, the first six chapters or points of view of A Game of Thrones, which is the first book in the A Song of Ice and Fire series. So those include the prologue, Bran, Caitlin, Daenerys, Eddard, and Jon. So if you have not read these points of view out of the Game of Thrones and you do want to follow along with us, pause now, go pick up the book, get some reading done, make, a, make yourself a little cup of tea. Uh, finish them off and then come back and press play. All right. So, uh, let's get right into it. Um, the, I'm going to give everyone a short summary on the actual prologue that our, our first taste of George R. R. Martin's, uh, wide and wonderful world of, uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. So the prologue opens on three, uh, characters, um, we get, we get a short glimpse into their complex lives. They are three brothers of the Night's Watch who um, guard and keep safe the wall that divides Westeros, where the 
primary excitement of the of the book happens from the uh the wild north which is beyond the wall so it's basically like canada and then below the wall is the united states where everyone is civilized and uh ruled correctly so the the I like black that. brothers Very good. yeah yeah um, you guys have outed yourselves already i wasn't gonna out brooke is canadian or Matt, <laughs> as as heavily religious. I wasn't going to do either, and you outed yourselves in the first five minutes of this podcast. <laughs> We're all friends here. Go ahead. All right. All right. I'm this is a safe it. place. Okay. Um, a character of note in the prologue is um, Sir uh, Wayman Royce. My yeah, Waymar Royce is how that's pronounced. Uh, he is a new uh, recruit to the Brothers Black. He was... Uh, a fifth or sixth son of a, a noble house down in Westeros and uh, got presumably kicked up to the wall because uh, there was not enough money to go around or some of the bigger houses. Oh, you know what? I'm spoiling now. Okay. I'm going to stop. Deal. That kind of Back stuff it up doesn't, a little bit. It's, it's, that stuff's cool. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. The official go I'm, ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it ruins the story for anybody. But. Mm. Okay, okay anyway. so they are up beyond the wall, as ordered by um, the uh, leader of the Black Brothers, to range and find some criminal wildlings. So these are um, Canadians who have maybe come beyond the wall and poached or um, uh, are just causing trouble for the Black Brothers. That is never really explored. Whatever the case, they're out in the woods. They've been riding for nine days. It's super cold. And one of them, the old grizzled Black Brother, gets a chill. And uh, there's a lot of just feelings and uh, this grizzled old Black Brother trying to convince the new um, – Recruit who is a, a bit of a, a snob, and also George R. R. Martin makes sure that we know that this 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 young lordling is super good looking, which I appreciate. Capital A, and uh, the the third guy, don't worry about it. He is an ex poacher. He's really good at sneaking up on people, and uh, that's pretty much all that he adds to the prologue. Anyways, these guys um, find the wildling camp. All of the wildlings are dead. Oh my goodness. However, uh, when the, uh, when they go back to investigate further, um, all of the bodies are gone. Weapons are laid down in the snow. The fire has been left unattended and it's just getting colder and colder. And then our first introduction, introduction to the primary antagonists in the whole series, the others. So the others are a supernatural, presumably supernatural, um, race of white creatures who kill with beautiful swords made of crystal ice. And, uh, yeah, they take out at least one of the guys, uh, Raymer Royce, who is the, um, lordling. And then, uh, yeah, his body comes back to life. Turns out when they kill you with one of their crystal swords, you turn into zombie. He kills the kid who can sneak around, and then the grizzled old black brother goes running back down south. And that is the end of the prologue. Does that about wrap it up? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. that was not 30 seconds. And <laughs> uh, future note, practice this before you come on uh, <laughs> to record it. You All did right. fine. You did you great. Did fine. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. great. You know, other okay, than you know, forgetting so, what the Night's Watch was called. No big deal. Nice. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> okay. So now that we have a short summary of the prologue, let's discuss uh, where where George R. R. Martin was trying to go with this initial introduction because it does have some significance. This is where the entire saga begins. Um, so are the others standard fantasy pair enemies, or are they something more? And this question is prompted, for those of you reading along with us, uh, by the complexity of the first three characters we meet. Uh, George R. R. Martin, as we get going, we're going to discover, does not write black and white characters. And I don't mean that, but like Caucasian and African-American <laughs> characters. I mean, like, good and bad characters. All good, all bad, which is pretty typical for most fantasy genre um epics um he writes gray and this was pointed out more uh eloquently by matt thacker during his initial read 
but uh, it, it begs the question, are the others complex as well? So I hand this question over to you guys. When I first read the, when I first picked up the book and started reading it, it did seem like standard fantasy fare for me at, at the first initial read through. You know, you've got these guys who are exploring along and they come across these fantastical creatures who kill them all. So they, it did seem very one dimensional dudes that just are bent on killing humans. That's what I originally saw them as. Uh, I do think it, it begs the question as to whether there is some depth to their characters. And right now I don't know. Mm. Scatty, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, a standard fantasy fair complete with swords made of fucking ice that break <laughs> all other things they come in contact with, right? Like, Yeah, they shattered the knight's sword. So great. You don't get any more standard fantasy than that, right? The the being made of the elements of the earth. It's like a, you know, that, that's that's just a legend, uh, you know, that... You know, you, you can see in tons of, of fiction, You're not exactly like that, but but a similar theme. You know, the, the cold beings from the north, kind of thing, and you know, you don't you don't get much of a hint in the first. You know, whether these are beings with motivations or whether they're just cold blooded, literally killers, or you know what they are. And uh, you know, I, I think. Um, you know, I, I I would have loved to have been in Brooke's shoes and have having read these before they were all uh, they're not all released yet, but before they were all released and you know just had this wonder at the beginning as you know to to where it was going. I, I read through these things so fast and got so many answers, you know later. But what what really drives these things? Does anything drive them? You know, are they I just will it, yeah. Uh, I will admit that my like bloodlust is is <laughs> part of what got me hooked on these books because he did open up with some like slaughter and not only just slaughter, zombie slaughter. I was like, oh, I'm in. Okay, great. I'll keep reading, even though the thing like hurt to hold in my hand. It was so big. So, but but you know um, what's, you know what's different about this fantasy fair that then that that tipped me off maybe the first read that it was going to be something different. And I brought this up in my notes too, but you, with most fantasy novels, you get an immediate introduction to a main character. You get into a world that you're going to see through their eyes. You get introduced quickly because they want to catch your attention and hold it with that character. And you're going to get to know them. George gives you three dudes who basically are probably going to die. Throwaways. <laughs> They're throwaways, and he, do and he he doesn't just give you their names and then kill them. He gives you background. He gives you depths. He gives you house history for, for where they're from. He gives you all this information about these people and then just kills them, right? Except for, you know, the one guy, Brooke says, that gets away. And you're left being like, holy crap. This is, you know, this is the opening to a novel. This isn't some throwaway scene later where you can introduce some villains or whatever. This is like the opening scene of a novel. And what you're doing is giving me three characters that I'm not going to have to care about at all. And I and, thought it was just awesome. I think that what he does there, I agree, is is he makes you care uh, on a couple of different levels. Like, for example, with Royce, he's this guy that is a total douchebag, and you hate him from the beginning because of the way that he acts and the way that he treats the other brothers at the Night's Watch. But then when it comes down to it, when he's surrounded by these freaky others, his sword's up and he's as brave as any other guy you've ever seen before, and he, and he goes down swinging, you know? Uh, and so you care about him, and then you're kind of sad that he died because of his final stand, despite the jerk that he was before that. And then on an even broader level, you know, we're about to read these other chapters, and whatever they talk about, in the back of our mind, we're always going to be thinking about those others. And <laughs> we'll be like, no matter what's happening, in the back of our mind, there's freaky dudes who can kill anybody with ice swords and blue eyes just beyond the wall. And, and that's, that's really scary. And it's brilliant by Martin to, to keep, to keep that in the back of your mind all the time. You're enjoying a meal. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> there There's others right coming. Out there. <laughs> um, yeah, I know it is great. And he gives you just enough information that you could even take it further. You say that, that, uh, Royce was brave. I would say that his pride actually drove him. So George introduces to a character with uh, 
so much pride that he would actually stand up against these crazy, unstoppable, supernatural beings. And who else is going to write that? Who else is going to is going to actually explore that that uh, that uh, atypical depth? I love it. For, For somebody he's going to every- throw away. Yeah. 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 <laughs> For somebody he's going to throw away. The- at the same time, though, and I should have done a count, just within the prologue, he probably mentions like six different houses, six different geographical regions throughout the world. Yeah. And it, that's like that's almost like like he's testing you. Like if you can get through this, if you guys can swallow this down, then you're allowed to read the rest of the book. Yeah. yeah. And he picks up on it almost like right as if as if he's been talking about it with you in a conversation for years and he just brings uh-huh. it up like you already know what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's that's daunting and it's intriguing at the same time. We get into that a little bit too. I think we will at least with the the Caitlin chapter. Uh, uh, Cat Catlin. Cat. How do you guys say that name? I say Catlin. Catlin. Uh, I say Caitlin and then Cat when they shorten it. Ugh. Yeah. The inconsistency. What, is, what do they say on the show? Um, Catlin, I think. Catlin, but, the, I think. but there's, I don't know if we should bring this up now. It's a reasonable diversion. But Matt found a, an article where George is basically saying, "I don't care how you pronounce it." He's uh, what did you call him? The anti-Tolkien, right? Yeah, I don't exactly. Care how you pronounce the names. Mm. I say them a certain way. We had diction experts come in and language experts, and they wanted to say them different ways. And you know, they've had readers of the novels, like for book on tape stuff, and they say them different ways. And he's like, "Say them however you want to say them." Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't care. care. Yeah. Whereas you've got Tolkien who, as Matt pointed out to me, wrote the books so that he could write a language uh, instead of writing <laughs> he a wanted language a framework that he for the to books. present his language. Exactly. Yeah, kind of, <laughs> so he wrote you know, a story. <laughs> but uh, uh, we can say – so I think we can say the names however we want. Yep. That's what I would mm-hmm. say. But anyway, I was, I was just going to say the Catlin chapter uh, I think does that a lot. You're, you're just he, – he just uses these chapters to drop all this information. You don't even realize you're getting it in that – in that way, but he's kind of spoon feeding it to you all the way through. Right. And you're just doing it in this almost delicate way. And by the end of these chapters, you just know so much and you don't even realize you've been reading a history of, of the continent. Right. Mm. And and it's also why. Story. Yeah. And it's why the game of Thrones, like the original book is so comforting because it is so much backstory and kind of eases you into it and intrigues you and, and gives you all this interesting exposition before he just goes headlong into 18 different plots. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, um, <laughs> I am making the executive decision for us to move on. Oh, um, good decision. Good? Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Scad, if you wouldn't mind bringing us up to speed on Bran's point of view. Yeah, so... Uh, I don't know whether this means anything or not, but the first, the first point of view chapter, not called prologue, the first point of view chapter we get is through Bran, seven-year-old boy, uh, the Stark family. He gets invited to his first execution Boo. with his brothers. <laughs> so uh, somewhat of a rite of passage. Um, you know, they, they get invited to an execution at a certain age when their father thinks they're ready. And... Uh, little disconcerting that these executions are apparently happening that frequently, but we'll get to that a little bit later, perhaps. So he believes the man being executed is, is a wildling, which uh, Brooke alluded to the wall and, and those north of the wall. Generally, those north of the wall are just referred to as wildlings. They're human. Um, you know, they're just, they're wildlings. They're not, uh, they're, they're kind of wild nature, not governed by kings and things like that. So they're, it's kind of a minor spoiler, I suppose, but you get there pretty quick. So I'm not too worried about it. Um, Mm -hmm. So basically just people that live north of the wall. Um, and you don't know much about the wall yet, but you're in for a doozy. So uh, in reality, though, this man uh, that they're about to execute is Garrett, who uh, Brooke mentioned was the, the Night's Watch brother that ran away, that, that saw his two fellow brothers get, get killed by these, uh, these others uh, and, and ran away. And he basically fled – the Night's Watch, which we'll get more into that too, but it's a sacred order, and you're not allowed to desert. Uh, and he's basically just left. Um, so through this, you know, this is really a, a character building chapter for Bran, where we get to see, you know, see this kid, and he's got some older brothers. He's eager not to show his fear, anxiety during the execution. Um, he wants to behave like a a man grown, which is a phrase you'll see uh, George use throughout the series, a man grown. Um, so they uh, they execute this guy. Um, 
they don't really tell you why um, at that point. They just execute him. So they're, now they're on their way back, and you know Brown's proud of himself. His bro- brothers are proud of him. He didn't, you know, he didn't lose his lunch or anything. So they're on their way back, and Rob and John. Um, Rob is 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 one of Brown's brothers. John is uh, a half brother of his, and we'll get we'll get more into that a little bit later. Uh, but they decide to race back toward Winterfell. Oh, uh, what's Winterfell? Winterfell is the castle where the Starks live, and the Starks are a, a family in this series, and they, they have a castle and a kind of a, a hold fast named Winterfell. So uh, while they race ahead, Bran gets a brief discussion with his father, um, who explains that, um, that the, the guy they killed was actually deserted from the Night's Watch, and that any deserter of the Night's Watch um, has committed treason and must be killed. This is, uh, he also conveys to Bran the importance of swinging the sword yourself when you're delivering an execution, and I think we'll get into that a little bit more later, but it's something that's very important to the Starks of Winterfell. Um, and uh, so so he's having this nice chat with uh, with Bran, uh, with, with, his, with his father, and and all of a sudden, Rob and John call back, and they, you know, they indicate that something's going on up ahead where they've ridden. And uh, so everyone races ahead to catch up with Rob and John. And what they find is a huge dead fucking wolf. <laughs> and surrounding it are five wolf pups. But this isn't. This is, it's not an ordinary wolf. It's a dire wolf. And if you're not familiar with with uh, dire wolves in traditional fantasy, they're just giant, nasty wolves, basically. Um, one of the characters mentions that nobody's seen a dire wolf south of the wall in 200 years. It's dead, though, um, and nothing but these five pups, you know, remaining. And, you know, they wonder what killed it, what could kill a beast of this size. Uh, and they inspect it, and they find that it was speared through the neck by an antler. And uh, so one of the characters, Theon, who we'll meet a little bit later, uh, a little bit better, uh, you know, we know you don't know him yet, but he, he just says, these things are evil. We need to kill them right now. And Ned, uh, the dad, Papa Stark, is about to give the order to do just that. But uh, Bran and Rob fight, and they say, no, no, we want to keep him. We want to keep him. And um, we'll raise him. We'll take him out <laughs> to the bathroom. We'll feed him, all that stuff. And, you know, Ned's kind of waffling a little bit. And then John steps forward. John, the half-brother of both Rob and Bran steps forward with a, a little piece of brilliance. And he says, well, I didn't mention this, but the dire wolf is your sigil. Papa Stark. His name is What's Ned. a sigil? It's come on. <laughs> <laughs> dire wolf is your God, sigil. What are, sigil what are is just a, 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 an emblem that represents your house. So it's kind of like a mascot. Dark, the mascot. Yes. A, a mascot that you put on the flag for your house. Um, so, he says the dire wolf is your your emblem, your mascot. You've got five natural born children, and there are five pups. And it's fate that we found them here, and they were meant for your children to have them. And people are kind of nodding and you know, agreeing. And Ned says, "Okay, fine. You all my kids now have dire wolf pups." And I would just like to add that I think this is pretty poor parenting, but he gives them all a nice <laughs> little dire wolf to raise. So. But if they um, pee on the floor, oh, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so as they ride off, they're about to ride off across the bridge, and then John hears something else. Uh, John, the, the half-brother that, that convinced Ned to let, the chi- let them ki- keep the dire wolves, hears something else behind them, and he jumps off his horse, and he runs over there, and he finds another dire wolf pup, making six total. And this one's albino, and it's got red eyes, and it's also the only one with its eyes open. And I don't know whether that means something or you want to read something into that or not, but uh, it's the only pup that has its eyes open. And John claims that one for himself, being the sixth child, uh, a a half-brother, a bastard child. We'll get into that a little bit more later, too. And so I think we wanted to get into, into uh, a, a side question on that chapter. Uh, Brooke, do you have that handy? Um, yeah, so basically, this is almost too good to be true, especially for the Stark children, who, 
now get to uh, raise and enjoy giant wolves as companions and guardians. Um, and it's indicative of just what a massive troll George R. R. Martin is. Like he loves dropping this kind of stuff like this, this, um, uh, foreshadowing that is that is so obvious that it almost like lulls you into a false sense of security. Five <laughs> pups for five children? Oh, they're going to grow up so strong. And and uh, oh, I'm I'm veering into. <laughs> did you just hiss at me? <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, like, uh, you know what? Uh, staying away from specific spoilers, <laughs> this is just our first experience with George <laughs> setting us up for potential, you know, things aren't as, as uh, you think it's too good to be true. Five pups plus a sixth one who is albino and his eyes are open just for the bastard Jon Snow who also gets his own point of views. Well, it is too good to be true. So he has set um, us up for with an amazing amount of hope, right? Sure these has. Kids oh, my with these new pups that are gonna grow up and be their best friends. And, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Very well. And this is why I my first read through. I thought of this as your typical you know fantasy type story. You've got yeah. the bad guys that were established in the prologue, and then in this first chapter, you automatically know who the "Quote unquote good guys are they're the Starks, right? Because you got you got this with all this foreshadowing and everything, they've got to be the heroes. But queft with cool pups, ugh, so yep. great. Oh, yep. can we just side note here, and we're gonna find this out within the chapters that we are discussing today. Ned Stark at this time giving all of this like absolutely golden advice to his children is thirty. Matt, I know that you're still a bit of a youngster, but that is basically our age. 35 and he is just a font of knowledge and wisdom. Mm-hmm. I think That's when a I lot originally of Yeah, when I originally read the books I was significantly younger. So and you know you're in that stage where any anybody over 25 is ancient and yeah, of course they have all of this wisdom and life experience. Now being his age looking back, if I if I had to like <laughs> Call my seven-year-old in front of a man who was getting his head locked off. I'd be like, don't look, Timmy. Don't look. <laughs> but uh, I thought it was, it was, yeah, you're right. It was handled in the way that, you know, these guys are the heroes. And, and Ned Stark is definitely a hero from the point of view of all of his children. Absolutely. Even the bastard. Absolutely. Yeah, and that uh, I just want to jump back to the execution scene uh, real quick. Um, that was for those of you that don't know. That was I can't remember the specific story, but George had a dream or a vision or or this thought pop into his head of, of just this scene of of these of these of these kids, this this one kid watching his father do this, and from this one thought, kind of spraying the rest of this whole universe. That he, mm-hmm. that he wrote around. He's like, I want to write about that scene I thought about. And he wrote it and he started writing about it and he just kind of kept going. And, uh, you know, obviously a million edits later, probably really a million, uh, you know, he had slow yeah. plotting, two finger typing edits. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> and I just think it's, I think it's amazing. You know, you hear a lot about how people come up with ideas and usually it's some broad concept that, that they have to rein in from here and there. And, no, this is just a simple scene. Like it could have ended up being a short story. It could have ended up being a poem. Like who knows, right? But it's just the single scene that he had. He had enough passion about that he wanted to just start writing it down. And uh, I don't know for those aspiring writers out there. You never know what'll turn into something huge, right? So the next chapter rolls into uh, some more introduction to the to a major part of the Stark family, and that's Catelyn. We find out really quickly that Catelyn is Eddard's wife and uh we get to know her a little bit as she is going to what is called the god's wood to find her husband and there he's cleaning his sword after using it it got a little dirty with uh gred guts <laughs> um, and <laughs> and they needed to clean it this is it's kind of a cool little side story about his sword it's called ice and it's made of valyrian steel which is this this steel that is uh, beautifully forged and and 
They say that nothing holds an edge or a, a sharp edge better than Valyrian steel. And it's also Valyrian steel is supposed to be uh, endowed with um, with magic at times. They say that, that Valyrian steel does have a certain sort of magic to it that we'll probably learn a little bit more about later. George just hints to it a little bit in these initial chapters. But uh, apparently Eddard goes to this godswood Every time he has to execute somebody, uh, he does take it very seriously. It's not something he enjoys doing, and the godswood is a bit of a is a, a refuge for him to go back and kind of reflect and, and I think kind of get his head back on straight after having to do something that he really doesn't like to do. So there we also find out a little bit about the theology of Westeros and the different religions that are floating around there. She, Catelyn mentions that Eddard uh, subscribes to the religion of what is called the Old Gods. These Old Gods are called such because they've been around for a long time with the initial inhabitants of Westeros. Uh, the first kind of intelligent beings were the what were called the children of the forest, and we're going to learn more about them later. But uh, the the gods that they subscribed to were the old gods. It's kind of almost a, a, a naturalist type of religion, worshiping you know trees and animals and stones and things like that. And that tradition carried on. Uh, Eddard will find out is has the blood of the first men in him. We'll learn a lot more about the kind of the history of Westeros and who these first men were. But these first men came over to Westeros and after some wars with the children of the forest, they actually came to peace with them and adopted their gods. And so Eddard comes from that line of first men who adopted those old gods and he, he worships them too. Catelyn, on the other hand, we find out, subscribes to the Faith of the Seven, as it's called. Now, this is a later religion that was brought on by another group of uh, kind of pilgrims to Westeros called the Andals. I guess we could probably call them more invaders. Uh, they came in and brought with them this Faith of the Seven, and she subscribes to that religion. So you think that that might be a conflict. A religion has been a conflict for as long as religion has been around, both on a grand scale and among just families. And so you might think that that could end up being some sort of conflict for them. But as we get into Catelyn and Eddard, we see that their devotion to each other seems to outweigh any spiritual differences that they might subscribe to, uh, which is really beautiful and touching and only adds to that sense of these guys are cool and these guys are the heroes. Um, they seem to be especially devoted to each other. The hard and icy Eddard Stark lets his guard down around Catelyn, and you can tell they have a loving and, and tender relationship. Um, so they sit down and they start talking in the godswood. She just kind of wants to be there for him, but she also has some news for him. Eddard reflects a little bit at first about how the Night's Watch is becoming weaker. It's this huge wall that they have to guard against the north. But uh, as it said, the wall is only as good as the people who who fortify it and who guard it. And there's not very many left. So he's really worried, um, not only because the numbers of the Night's Watch is dwindling, but a lot of them are dwindling because of him. He's having to execute these deserters, <laughs> which is only cutting down <laughs> on members of the Night's Watch. He has no idea why they are deserting. He's worried about wildlings. Uh, they have kind of um, Scott, Scott explained it very well that they're kind of, they don't have a king or anything, but many of them, it turns out, follow this dude who we don't know yet, but is mentioned named Mance Raider. And, uh, you know, they think that maybe he's amassing a big group of wildlings that are going to come and attack the wall. And meanwhile, you know, like we talked about how we care about the others from that opening prologue. Isn't it crazy what your mind does as you're reading this? You're like, no, it's not wildlings. It's freaky guys with ice swords and blue eyes. They're going to come and kill you. Edder. You know, like, no, don't, <laughs> you're so stupid. Uh, but he's worried about that, uh, but he's about to get hit with a couple other major points of news. This is wonderful. This is wonderful storytelling by Martin because he's weaving the past with the present like we already talked about. He's creating this tapestry almost of empty spaces and he's slowly filling them in little by little. He's advancing the story while also letting you know about the past. And so Catelyn breaks this news to him that a guy called John Aaron had just died. Uh, this hits Ned really hard, and we find out why. We find out that John was actually a guy who basically raised Eddard. 
Um, Eddard was sent from his home in Winterfell at a young age to be raised as a ward by this guy named John Aaron, who apparently loved him a lot. If, in fact, it says he loved him so much that when this a strange dude who's called the Mad King Ares in the chapter demands that John bring Eddard to him to execute him. Uh, John chooses to revolt against the king rather than give up Eddard. So we find out that there is this love and tenderness, and, and even more so that's enhanced later on when Eddard marries Catelyn and John marries Catelyn's sister, Lysa. So this man who raised him, essentially, becomes his brother-in-law. And so they do have a very close relationship. They don't know how he died. He was serving uh, the king down in the place where the king lives, down south of Winterfell, called King's Landing, and he died there. Then, as if that wasn't enough, she hits him with some more news. She tells Eddard that the king of Westeros, Robert Baratheon, is coming to Winterfell for a visit, and he's bringing his whole entourage with him. Ned is both excited and, um, I don't know if we'd say frustrated's the right word, but he, he's a little overwhelmed. Uh, it turns out Robert Baratheon's his best friend, as it uh, is explained there. He was actually another ward uh, of John Aaron's, and so Eddard and Robert grew up together which is very cool. And they became friends and uh, battled together. Um, they served together throughout different wars and we'll find all about all about their history as we go along. But he is now coming to visit Eddard up in the north. And isn't that interesting that he's coming just after John Aaron dies? So it's been seven years since they'd last seen him. Eddard's excited because it's his best friend, but he's also worried because of the logistics of hosting a king and all of his entourage, the food, the the cost, the living arrangements, all of that. Uh, also, a little bit of tension we find out from the queen who's coming. Uh, the queen is a member of a family called the Lannisters, and the Lannisters are a family that Eddard is not extremely fond of for many different reasons, but uh, he's he is worried about the tension that might arise from the Lannisters being in his home. So we got a lot explained to us in that in that short chapter. The chapter is actually not very long, but we learned so much, not only about uh, Eddard and his relationship with Catelyn, but also about just this whole history. And we're getting into it, and, these, and, and George is just feeding us these little nuggets or morsels of cool story that we can't wait to hear more about. Um, and, and was that long enough of a <laughs> geez of a summary? Freaking a! No, it's awesome, and I like the um, way that you describe what he's feeding to us—nuggets and morsels. It's true, and it is not. Um, and typically, fantasy world building, like you got to pay a lot of attention. You got to be like on the ball because you never know when it's going to veer away from something relatable. But George has kind of like hit that sweet spot where. Uh, the history of West Rose and, and its current culture just aligns enough with what we recognize from like historical fiction that that we're like, OK, we can follow along. And and instead of concentrating on, it, you know, the cultural differences between you know, what I know and what uh, uh, West Rose practices, we can concentrate on the characters and uh their individual personalities and motives and and behaviors yeah we're starting to get these glimpses that this is built around the characters it's not built around a specific plot line right it's it seems to be built around characters and that's really cool totally yeah i wanted to drop a little note in there too about you you mentioned uh <clears throat> ned and, and and robert baratheon being uh wards uh uh, of John Aaron, and this might seem weird, uh, you know, to a, to a reader, but it, it's it's reasonably common. They, they mention it again in another chapter that we're that we're going to go into. It's a, it's a reasonably common thing for the nobles to send some of their children to be raised for at least a time in another place, and it's it's not an uncommon thing in that world to to do that. I don't think that's a that's too bad bad of a spoiler either. Just uh, it's not like they hate their children or anything like that. Or, you know, they were what, being mistreated. What do you think the benefit is of doing that? Just as a father myself, I'd never want to send my kids away from me. But there's obviously seems to be some sort of success formula for doing that. 
Well, I, I, I think part of it is relationship building. <laughs> um, mm, networking? You know, net, yeah, it's almost like old school networking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I trust mm-hmm. you to raise to raise my kid. Later, maybe you'll trust me to give your daughter to one of my kids in marriage. You know, kind of a, a relationship building thing. Uh, mm. I think that's part of it. Mm-hmm. Also, I think it, it helps to like harden the children, and yeah. and I would I would liken it to um, in uh, Naomi Novik's uh, Temeraire series when the kids of the Dragon Riders basically just get sent off at nine or ten to work on these dragons away from their parents because if they if they can't become hardened in that flame quite young they're never going to make it as adults and i and i think the same goes for sorry scad for (laughs) heading into some dragon lore but i think the same thing applies to these kids of these noble houses is basically like you sink or swim and 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 the the very title of the novel gives that away it's a game of thrones so these kids are in it to win it and you better be as prepared as possible interesting yeah interesting so we touched on this a little bit but uh just with the whole others and you know um edard and the wildlings and everything going on there and him thinking that it's just wildlings and the the others actually come up in he and Catelyn's conversation and they dismiss it as just uh, kind of old wives tales or old Nan tales, as it were. Old Nan is a character who we're going to find more about later, but they dismiss it as just kind of fairy tales, um, which is interesting because like we said, in our head, we're just screaming at these guys to just go look, look at what they did. They're going to kill everybody. <laughs> uh, so I wonder, you know, what, what kind of conflict is that going to cause throughout the story as we've got these, you know, these people who are so worried about the king coming and how they're going to feed and house the king that they're missing the real danger? Well, so I, I brought this up in some of my notes um, from my reading, but I just think they, they you know, they, they kind of dismiss them. They, they dismiss the concept of others entirely, um, you know, and, and actually – I thought it was silly too. Like, you know, why aren't you worried about this all the time? You know, why, why wouldn't you be terrified that this might happen at any point? But they mention in, in the text there that nobody has seen an other if they ever existed. And they almost everybody always says that if they even exist, no one's seen them for 8,000 years. It's an interesting dichotomy. It's like, why, why would you say, why would you follow up if they exist with no one's seen them for 8,000 years? If they don't mm-hmm. exist, no one would have ever seen them. So it's it's mm-hmm. kind of an interesting thing. Like they, they don't want to believe that they're there, but some part of them nag, is nagging them that, that they really are there. But if you think about – and I don't know whether, whether Martin slipped up here or not, but 8,000 years is a really, really long damn time. Like, mm, I like the way you outlined that. Like everybody forgets what happened 8,000 years ago. If no one had seen an other for 8,000 years ago, no one should believe they exist. No one would remember that. Do you know how many generations that is? So I did, I did do some quick research about what happened 8,000 years ago in our world. Uh, wine was just invented. The land bridge connecting Britain to the rest of Europe was just engulfed. Agriculture was just being discovered. The Copper Age came to the Fertile Crescent. So these, these are all like historical events that happened a really long, long time ago that no one remembers – like it's not that surprising that no one believes these things exist if it's really been that long since anyone's seen them. So I just wanted Good to bring point. that up because I thought it was I, – I, I don't know if that's what, what Martin entailed or, or it, it, uh, meant to do when he, when he really put a number of 8,000 years in there. But I think it makes it believable that no one believes these things exist. It's true, but, but he could also be accounting for the fact that um... – like they don't really count years, they count seasons, and those seasons are up to ten years long. So he could just be compounding that time and it becomes longer. Mm. But maybe my math is off. Well it, but, it, yeah. it would work good. in the reverse. If you count a year as well, if you if you count a year as a summer and a winter, then it would be way more than eight thousand years. I guess it comes down to how they count years. But. Yes, it might. <laughs> Yeah, it might. 
Um, but uh, thanks for doing all that research. I didn't even know that there was a land bridge that connected the UK to the, to the rest of the continent. Thank you for proving but, my point. Uh, That's because you're from Canada, right? Like, I didn't they don't believe teach it. That in Canada. You, didn't, you didn't even know that there was a land bridge. They didn't. They didn't even know that there were others. Like it's amazing the legend has even survived, right? I'm still waiting for the land bridge between the U.S. and Canada to be engulfed. <laughs> I, I, um, I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> wow. Wine it has been invented? That is actually fascinating. Sorry. Um, uh, I like history. So, uh, which I think is one of the reasons I love this book or, or this series of books. Just very, just so much history and so much thought into the history. Yeah, there's so much meta within the book. And if, if you, if that is like up your alley, you're going to, do you have a bird? No, you what don't is want to that know. noise? It's a oh smoke alarm. It's a smoke alarm. Needs a battery change. Needs a new battery. Yeah. <laughs> You're just letting it go. It has, don't it's you been have like a, a day. Young child? It's been like a day. <laughs> is it your wife, Frankens? No, we got like nine of them. It's Kids? also really only a problem if you like to set fire to things in your house. <laughs> Let's get to <today>. day. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, well, um, I will say, have, have we covered everything that we want to talk about with Caitlin? Because it was a, it was a pretty significant chapter. Anything else we want to bring up religion wise or, um, the, the God's stuff wise? is fascinating to me. Yeah. And I, I, I'm totally. excited to learn more about it. I, I love the, I love the idea of these two kind of competing religions, um, but are they competing? It, it sounds to me like they're very tolerant of each other. Oh uh, yeah, I guess I just meant competing for your brain's uh, adoration. I think the the theology is is quite competitive. Uh, it's it's the the worship of the old gods seems to be a very primal religion, uh, whereas the the faith of the seven seems to be very you know almost contemporary. It's like a lot of religions that we see today, uh, you know, with priests and censors of incense, incense, um, and rituals, uh, large cathedrals, that kind of thing. So, yeah. I mean the, the old gods, it's almost like a druidic kind of, I mean, you go into the damn forest for goodness right. sake to, to pray, you know, but they, yeah. And, but they do seem to be very tolerant of each other. They say in the chapter, you know, that most castles, even in the South where the old the religion of the old gods is almost extinct, even in that South part of Westeros, almost every castle has a God's wood, uh, where, you know, someone who worships the old gods could go to. Um, but many, of, they say that many of them have kind of turned into quasi gardens where you just walk yeah. through to have a good time and relax, with but no, they're there with no werewood, right? Which is kind of the central central figure in a in, in the a godswood godswood. is supposed to be this weirwood tree with the they talk about with the painted face and the hmm. um, you know the red leaves and and the the houses in the south it sounds like most of them don't have them right um, right and i, I found, found that interesting like did they was that a competing thing did the the seven you know did they accidentally take hatchets to their werewoods or did the werewoods not feeling the love from the people diminish and, and fall off, you know, something they, like that. They were, they were, uh, they were destroyed mostly. The, when the first men came over, I, I kind of briefly mentioned that there was quite a bit of warfare going on and the first men did chop down a lot of the weirwood trees. They of course felt awfully bad for that once they made friends with the children of the forest and adopted those gods uh, for themselves. Spoilers. But, <laughs> but then the, <laughs> I don't think it's a spoiler, is it? Uh, uh, no, I think it gets covered. Do they talk about the children of the forest? I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ned yeah, mentions, or Caitlin mentions it. All right. Yeah, and then the when the Andals came over, they uh, they pretty much cut down the rest. So. <laughs> well, I think uh, with all, with all religions too, you can't make money off of the old gods where there is no place of worship, where basically you're just going out and praying in the forest. But you can certainly tithe to one of these seven gods with faces who, you know, you can worship the hag or worship the stranger or worship the warrior. Well, you can also give money to them. So, <clears throat> OK, well, let's uh, let's press on. Um, I'm going to give a short summary of Daenerys first point of view. George has now moved us 
and he doesn't actually explain this, but presumably across the sea to the free city of Pentos, which is part of a collective of free cities. And uh, just just when you thought you had enough on your plate identifying places in Westeros, let's let's head across the sea and explore some new cultures. Let's just <laughs> pile it on. So um, Daenerys is uh, one of two remaining heirs to the Targaryen throne of the Seven Kingdoms. And the Seven Kingdoms kind of covers all of Westeros. And the Targaryens were defeated in a... A uh, huge bloody battle by uh, Robert Bartharian and his compatriots, which include Ned Stark. And all of this gets covered in the first six chapters, even if Daenerys isn't walking us through the history of this war. But uh, to give you some idea of why they were chased out is because they, um, the last ruler of the Targaryen throne was the Mad King Ares, which uh, Scott or, or maybe it was Matt did bring up. Um, he was mad because of years of inbreeding. The Targaryens like to keep their line pure, so they only marry to their sisters, which means that they all have gorgeous silver blonde hair and lilac eyes, which gets mentioned more than once, twice, or three times. But it also means that they're um, uh, not all there. Also, um, but but one advantage, no, the third advantage to uh, keeping the line pure other than hair and eye color is that they have a perhaps supernatural or perhaps just a um, behavioral um, way of uh, taming dragons. So uh, with the Targaryen line getting chased out of the Seven Kingdoms by King Bertharian, um all of the dragons were killed as well. So um, King Ares was killed by the Kingslayer, who we are going to meet in later chapters. And uh, one of the loyal knights to the Mad King Ares did manage to save his youngest uh, child, Viserys, who is Daenerys' brother. And Daenerys' mother, uh, Daenerys was just a... a an unborn child in her womb, newly conceived when they were whisked across the sea to um, um, the other side, which ugh, there's a grand name for the other side. And I can't remember what it was. Ethos. Guys, Essos. Ethos? Essos? I say okay. Essos. Fine. Okay. Anyway, so uh, Daenerys is born, kills her mother in childbirth, of course. This happens a lot. It's a, it's a common theme, just like uh, birthing bastards is. And um, Viserys, the other surviving heir to the Targaryen throne, never really forgives her for it. And um, the knight who whisked them away ends up dying of sickness, and they become... Um, uh, Viserys actually becomes nicknamed the Beggar King because they move from benefactor to benefactor, pretty much just just begging to live. He is a little bit delusional, perhaps because of the inbreeding, perhaps because uh, he's just been raised to believe that he is the rightful heir to uh, the Seven Kingdoms. Um, he believes that uh, one day he will regain his throne, and he's an ambitious little kid. Um, and, uh, he has a, he has a plan along with, um, a magistrate of Pentos. His name is Ilario. Um, he's going to sell off Daenerys, who is 13 and very calmly to a horse warlord named Cal Drago. So instead of marrying her, keeping the line pure, he's willing to sacrifice her, um, as a, uh, I guess, uh, just actually just to sell her in exchange for some of these Cal Drago's um, uh, horse warriors. And he's going to bring them back across the sea to the seven kingdoms and take back the throne. So uh, this is all from Daenerys point of view. And for a 13 year old kid, she is actually really smart. She, <laughs> uh, she, she puts up with Viserys and his um, manipulations because if she doesn't, uh, she he becomes enraged and uh, very abusive. What he calls and what she calls unleashing the dragon, and she fears that a lot. So she uh, keeps her head down, but she obviously does not trust Ilario. And um, as yeah, for thirteen year old 
very, very perspective perceptive and smart. And I think that George wants you to pick up on this for sure, because uh, one, she has a point of view chapter and uh, two, um, she's just making observations that, that, that no, no preteen would ever make. So where we leave off is they've got her all dressed up and uh, washed up and are presenting her at a party to Cal Drago to, uh, so he can check out the wares, see if she's worth something horse warlords for uh, some horse warriors for her brother. And uh, that is where we are. And, oh, hey, I forgot to mention her brother is no problem touching her inappropriately and twisting her nipples to get what he wants. So gross. So gross. And you're like, oh, I hate this kid so much. Yeah. He's and she creepy. takes it because she doesn't want to unleash the dragon. Yeah, I totally creepy. I mean, it, and, uh, and- and it, it it's worse because so we get introduced to them at you know she's thirteen and I don't want this to become you know multi minute discussion but we're introduced to her at thirteen and how long has he just been treating her this way and how long you know like who knows it's just it's just he, creepy he, you're meant to, you're 19. meant to, yeah yeah he's nineteen but who knows how long he's been treating her this way and you're meant to just loathe this guy from the very beginning. I think he, I think he's I think he's one of the examples uh and there are very few in my opinion but one of the examples of characters that that Martin writes with no redeeming qualities. I <laughs> pride I guess he he's very proud of his family and his history maybe that's a redeeming quality but just this Determined. slime ball guy that that you're just yeah. really meant not to like I think. And you know I think George uses that to great effect by making him as creepy as possible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when, you know, the discussion that we had of Westeros and, and, you know, these fathers trying to kind of toughen their kids up, uh, no toughening required from fathers when it comes to Danny. She just lived it, you know, she, she was naturally hardened just from living her life. And that's, that's tragic. But, uh, you know, she's she's kind of on that same arc, uh, but as someone like Bran, but maybe just more accelerated through her life experiences. The age thing, though, I don't know if you want to go back to that, Brooke, or not. But this is not just Danny at thirteen. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things we've seen already is just a bunch of young characters. Um, yeah, and and to to Matt's point, I think George recognizes that. Um, Teenagerhood is actually a construct of the 20th century that it never existed before. Basically, yeah. you were a child and then you were an adult. There was never this in between. Teenagehood was was developed by marketers so that they could sell teenagers teenage stuff like music and soda pop and 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 acne cream that never <laughs> it never I existed. like all three of those things. Uh, yeah, it never existed before the Second World War. You were a child, and then at one point, it was a very clear denilliation if you were a woman. You started bleeding from the uterus, and you were a woman. <laughs> started for, having kids. Yeah, for for dudes, maybe it was some other <laughs> thing that happened. I don't know. <laughs> Why don't you speculate for us? Yeah, let's not speculate. <laughs> Um, but, uh, um, and, and he, he doesn't, he doesn't pander to that. And, and I think it's, it's tough for us to swallow because teenagehood is such a formative time for us in our generation, but it never existed before, you know, two generations ago. And he, uh, he gets that and he's like, well, she's, she's had her first moon. <laughs> Let's marry her off now, and that is perfectly acceptable. Are you sure Cal Drago likes his women this young? Doesn't matter. She's already started bleeding from the uterus. <laughs> She's fertile. Yeah. Get him going. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's just an interesting line for the reader to walk, I think. I mean, maybe we're conditioned to, to believe these things because of marketing or, 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 you know, the last 50 years or whatever it is when that change has taken place. Nevertheless, we're conditioned to see it that way. And so it's a very difficult line for the reader to watch. I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, I don't know how deep we want to go into this, but like, like that, that's generally like, you know, any sort of child act like, like you're talking about with, with her and Drogo, that's, that's pornography. 
like in, in other media, that's pornography and, and unacceptable, right? And he's writing this and getting away with it and nobody cares. It's kind of it's just kind of weird to me that it wasn't a big deal when he was writing this, you know? Oh yeah, they've certainly mm-hmm. romanticized it with uh the television show that she's older in the television show, right? Oh yeah. Like, At least her parents is. All the children are all the yeah. children are older, aged up. Mm-hmm. And you know, we don't want to get into the TV show here really, but yeah, they they certainly didn't want to walk that line in that medium. Mm-hmm. Sure. But you're right. Nobody, nobody has kicked up a fuss except for me when I was trying to <laughs> warn Matt away from reading it. <laughs> dude, dude, this might not be up your and alley. All it did was spur him on. I don't know what that says about Matt. I don't know. Not up my alley. Looks like I'll try it out. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is, and and it's no holds barred. We're we're going full tilt into married off thirteen year olds and seven year olds watching executions, and it is it is a bit of a thrilling ride though because again, <laughs> I have some major bloodlust. It is it is like if I lived during Roman times and they had um, gladiator competitions at the Colosseum, I would be front row <laughs> looking for the blood splatter. <laughs> It is like something I've discovered about myself that is so frightening, and I think that it does that, actually still to a is lot of readers. It is. That is frightening. It is. <laughs> I'm terrified. <laughs> so uh, he's a, he's certainly a, a he is a, an entertainer extraordinaire. Certainly. All right. So, anything else that we wanted to to talk about as far as the Targaryens, dragons? Well, I just uh, I just want to say, Viserys. you know, Viserys, uh, and we, again, more names we pronounce differently, but Viserys, okay. uh, he he has this this feeling like, you know, Westeros, the other continent that they're no longer on, that they've been chased away from, is his. Right? He has this very strong feeling of. I don't know if you call it manifest destiny, something, right, that drives him, that he deserves it, that that's his. And it's just Mm -hmm. very interesting to think about. I mean, they they tell you, I think, right in this chapter that, you know, the Targaryens had only been ruling for 300 years. And to get ruling, they took it from somebody else who was ruling. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like this right that he feels like is his. You know, they took it from me and it's not theirs. And like, well, dude, your family took it from others. And I think, again, we've touched on this a little bit, but with, with Martin, nothing is, nothing is as black and white as it seems, right? And I think this is, it's just another example. Like, this is his view. He, he thinks this, but, well, some other people might not think that it's his, right? And, and they might have a, a valid perspective also. So I think just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. Also, and, and what else would drive him though, too? Like, you guys mentioned how Viserys or Viserys, um, is a totally irredeemable character, especially considering his behavior towards his sister. But I kind of feel for the guy. Like, what else does he have driving him? He was denied everything. He's fed all of these, uh, romantic tales by, um, uh, these rich people who take them in, who are, are hoping to gain, uh, some sort of return on their investment of taking care of these kids. And, and more than that, he's been fed, obviously, a lot of paranoid delusions about, um, um, assassins coming after him sent by Robert to kill off the last of the Targaryen line. So, he he has he has his own emotional manipulations to deal with, and, and I do feel for the kid um, because he has no guidance, no n- nobody um, to to tell him how, you know how he should be living his life, how he how he should be supporting his sister, and what else is he going to do but survive? Yeah, that's fair. Point. Maybe irredeemable yep. was too harsh. Yeah, you guys really, you guys really came down on that little nipple twister. <laughs> okay, in that case, let's go right on to Eddard. Daddy, do you mind taking it away? I'll take it away, and I'll go quickly. So, uh, as we learned in the previous chapter with uh, with Cat with Catelyn and Eddard, the king's party is arriving in Winterfell, uh, and so is Ned's best friend Robert Baratheon, who I'm now going to be calling Triple B to make it shorter. Um, <laughs> big, Bobby, big Bobby Baratheon. So uh, Ned hardly recognizes him now because he's, he's put on so much weight and he's, he's grown sloth-like and lazy. Um, the kids <laughs> are all introduced to each other, 
uh, the general formalities are paid, hugs given, uh, Ned kisses the queen's hand. We'll get to that a little bit more later. Uh, Triple B immediately asks to go pay his respects to Circe, or to, uh, uh, to the departed, and Circe makes a, a small fuss about it, and basically Triple B just ignores him, uh, ignores her, and, uh, the relationship seems a little bit icy. But, uh, so Ned takes the huffing and puffing, uh, Triple B down the stairs into the, the Winterfell crypt, and, uh, we learn that he wants to pay his respects specifically to Lyanna Stark, who is, who was his betrothed and who is Ned's, uh, older sister. Um, and on the way down, he complains about, uh, the length of the trip up to the north and how big the north is, and it's just another nugget that, that, uh, that Martin has dropped in to just kind of let us know how huge the north is, which, any fool can look at the map and see. The North is gigantic, uh, and, and the Starks kind of rule over all of it. Um, Canada. <laughs> Canada, right. Uh, so we also <laughs> see that all of the famous Starks of old, all the ruling Starks of old, are cast in stone by, by some stonemasons, right? And they kind of hover over their, over their own crypt. So they get to Lyanna's crypt, and Triple B laments that she's in this dark, cavernous place instead of in some nice, cheerful, sunny location somewhere else. And uh, Ned's just like, dude, she's a Stark. This is what we do. We bury our people here. And uh, and also indicates uh, something that it's what she asked. She asked to be brought here, and, and he was with her uh, as she was passing, and this is what she wanted. And uh, Big Bobby B then goes on to uh, lament that he could only kill Rhaegar once, as in, in total meathead fashion. Um, so they, had, they start heading back upstairs, uh, Ned's urging, and... Um, you know, saying Cersei's going to be waiting, your wife, and Triple B's just like, hey, the others can take my wife. Again, another indication that things are not so rosy in that marriage. Uh, <laughs> so as they walk, uh, Eddard asks uh, Triple B about John Aaron's death, and, and he basically finds out that he went from perfect health, he was the, the sign of, of life, uh, to death extremely quickly, something, something uh, Triple B hasn't seen like that before. Um, so, you know, even to the most dense reader, I think it implies, you know, maybe there's something a little unnatural there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, he also drops a bomb about, uh, little, little Robert Aaron. So John Aaron's uh, only son, I think he's eight or so. Um, but he's not going to be named the warden of the East, which, uh, we'll talk more about the wardens of the East and West and all that stuff when we got a little bit more time. But, uh, he also fears that Lysa Tully, who is Catelyn's sister and was his own, was John Aaron's own wife has gone a little bit cuckoo, and they ran away from, from King's Landing where they lived in the middle of the night and, and took her son with him and uh, won't let anybody see him and won't send him away to be a ward somewhere else where he can grow up with other children and stuff like that. And lastly, Triple B kind of gets he gets sick of talking about this. He's like, hey, wait a minute, i got something more important to talk about. So two, two main things. First, he wants Ned to become the Hand of the King, and... Uh, the the phrase two two phrases that come out of that phrase that that chapter that are fun what the king dreams the hand builds and the translation uh, from the common folk is the king eats and the hand takes the shit and I love that phrase <laughs> um, so basically the the hand is the king's right hand man and he does all of the dirty work for the king while the king goes around and has fun or does whatever he wants the hand is kind of responsible for really running the kingdom and he wants Ned to do this for him. He also proposes that his son Joffrey should be wed to Ned's daughter Sansa, uh, and that would complete the union that was meant to be completed uh, when uh, Lyanna died before before Robert could wed her. So <clears throat> Ned's not sure of either of these developments. He wants to stay in the North, feels like this is his place, and he wants to consult his wife Catelyn about about the two things, and so. Triple B gives him permission, you know, go go talk to her about it, but don't take too long. So that is that chapter uh, in a nutshell. Well, you know, th this is the the king and queen, and, you know, most fairy tales, you know, you got the happy king and queen ruling the land, and here we have this relationship which clearly has some discord in it. Um, and further, you know, it kind of just seems like nobody's a huge fan you know, Ned is, gives her a very cold reception, just kisses her lightly on the on the hand, whereas, you know, Triple B gives Catelyn a big hug. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she's the queen, so maybe it's a status thing that he's trying to just take care of, but right. just kind of seems icy in general. 
Oh, the, the, the biggest blow to her was running straight down into the crypts to pay, pay his respects. Because yeah. it was it was totally obvious that he wasn't like down there to pay respects to Ned's father or brother. It was definitely to his long lost love, Leanna Stark. And that is like, ooh, such a spit in the face. In front and of Cersei everybody. knows it too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she kept it together, considering. Yeah, yeah she did. It's true. Yeah. But yeah, I do think that it is kind of a, a, a testament to Eddard and, and, you know, despite the fact that Robert is his best friend, he does call him a lot of, you know, he's always calling him your grace, your grace. Uh, and, you know, the, the kissing of, of Cersei's hand and, and, you know, the respect that he affords her and everything contrasted with Robert, who's the king over the land, overweight and sweating through his silk clothes, um, picking up Catelyn in a huge hug in kind of that informal way. It's interesting to contrast those two characters, whereas the one in authority seems to be the one who's kind of lost, and Eddard seems to have it all together, uh, maybe to a fault. Um, mm-hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, it's also just just more emphasis on what a hero Ned is and how um, gracious he is, and 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 how the Starks are really the 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 pinnacle of of what an old family can be. Um, again, supported by being down in the crypts, and they're all like elegantly laid out with their with their likenesses carved in stone, and it's it's very formal, and 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 there's a lot of ceremony to it, and yeah, just more Starks are great. Everybody else kind of crap, even the king. <laughs> Wasn't it interesting that uh, the first glimpse that we get of Eddard and Catelyn is a very tender moment that they share just the two of them and you can feel that that tenderness in their relationship and the first glimpse that we get of of robert and cersei is decidedly different <laughs> good point. just just furthering you know the the building up of the starks is like you mm-hmm. said the pinnacle of all things good in mm-hmm. westeros so we've got four minutes do you want to do a little davos after dark uh, let's do it all right Davos after dark. So, uh, listeners, if you're still with us and you do not want to be spoiled, join us again next week because we're getting we're getting spoilery. Push pause. Mm-hmm. Push stop. stop. Turn it off. Okay. Goodbye. You've been warned. Yeah. And go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the the biggest thing is <laughs> the antler through the the wolf's throat. So obvious. Yeah. You know, like, come on. Are you doing this on purpose? Yeah. Do you, you really think we're that dumb? <laughs> <laughs> I was on my no, first but read. You don't recognize it because you don't know that the Baratheon sigil is a stag yet. Not um, until John's chapter when they do right. the procession. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I did not so, pick up on it the first time. I was like, oh, that's a shitty way to die. And I moved on. My, I, right. I, I, I don't know whether I'm just a dumb reader or or he keeps the pacing going so much and I was just voraciously reading that I just missed these things. But I missed a lot on my first read, and this is one of them. I didn't even see it. Hmm. And I'm embarrassed by it now. Don't be embarrassed. There's so much... So much that you can't pick up on. I was I was mostly distracted by the fact that there were maggots in the wolf's eyes, but there was also <laughs> frost on its fur. I'm like, no, that's not that's not how weather works. If it's cold enough to be frosty, there's no flies, hence no maggots. Mm. Yeah. Brooke the scientist. <laughs> Thanks. Really, really I'm letting, from the north. <laughs> really letting him have it. Well, while we're, while we're pointing out inconsistencies, oh no, we never mind. We can't do it. We didn't talk about the yeah. chapter yet. Oh yeah. Well, isn't it, it, it just just along the stag and the antler thing um and the dire wolf and all of that it you know kind of implying that the the Baratheon could it be that the Baratheons end up being the downfall of the Starks uh, in total not just you know with Ned getting his head lopped off lopped, lopped off later in the book but just overall you know would any of of all of this happened had Robert not come you know uh, out for revenge against Rhaegar Targaryen. Um, you know, it, it goes back pretty far, I think, in this whole uh, history of Westeros with the Baratheons and the Starks. And it could it could it be that deep that the uh, you know the Baratheon, his rage and his love for Lyanna is what caused the Starks to eventually become 
where they are now in the story. Oh, that, I love it. So human, so character driven. Which is a, which is such a broken family, you mm-hmm. know. It's also I wonder if it stops with with Ned getting his head chopped off, or if we're more in for more Baratheon indirect yeah. sabotage of the Starks. Well, Sometimes we're not done with some, Stannis. Yeah, exactly. We're not done with Stannis. I've even wondered, you know, Do wouldn't it be have, very yep, go ahead. Martin-y? And wouldn't it be very Martiny for you know Arya and Gendry to have built up this wonderful relationship, and then now they're separated, but then they come back together, and somehow Gendry's you know he ends up being a uh, something negative to Arya, you know? Yeah. Mm. And maybe the the pattern of Baratheon problems with Starks can continue. <laughs> I, I don't think that'll happen, but it would be such a Martin thing to do. Like, oh, you Wouldn't thought it? this was it. You thought I was yeah. just going to kill the head of your family that produced the five children, you know, and right. be the result of that. But no, it's actually much deeper than that. Yeah. It is so symbolic of the two lines. All right. I, I, I will just maybe just close this up because it is 1130 on the dot. Yes. But um, if any listeners are still with us, thank you so much for joining us on our inaugural podcast. And um yeah. See you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. All right. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And hey, everybody, don't forget to join us for our next episode. The chapters that we're going to be reading are John's first chapter, Catelyn's second, Arya's first, Bran's second, and Tyrion's first chapter. So John, Catelyn, Arya, Bran, and Tyrion. See you next time. Mm-hmm.